Ascombe United lost 4-0 at home to Exeter City this afternoon. Love it. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. We've got no games to talk about. Uh, so we will uh, talk about the non-existent game that happened. Welcome. Sit down. Josh Gowler will be joining us in a minute, and we'll be out here to answer your questions and, and sort of take anything uh, you'd like to ask him about his time, maybe at Hereford, at town, whatever, you know, what he sees in the future. Um, I guess we should, gent, firstly, Tom, welcome. Uh, still, still going with his first out. Um, how is everything with you on the south coast of England? Did uh, any gazebos, weedy bins get lost in this week's action? Yeah, it's been really windy. Uh, quite a few tiles flown off on my street. A couple of uh, telephone cables down. Quite exciting, really. We lost our gazebo, as everybody saw. That was spectacular. Also, giving us the south, southern pursuit situation. Nobody here is above the N M4 on this podcast today. Um, Mike, did you, nice to see you survived. Many casualties. <laughs> it was, it was all right, mate. We, we, we hung on just about survived. No, 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 uh, you know, uh, no trees down, no poles let down, nothing. We've all lost good. a couple of plant pots, which I'm devastated about. There we go. There we go. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a red weather warning. We all live within it. In fact, yeah, we all do live within it. Tom, you were even in the red weather warning down in Pompey, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, South End and some are saying the National League, in their ultimate wisdom, decided the best thing to do was to encourage ticket sales still at 11 o'clock that morning for a game which was going to be taking place, uh, you know, in a stadium. Probably wouldn't last particularly well in one of the worst storms in the last 20 years. Do you have any thoughts on it? I have a few. I think I'm a lot calmer now than I was when I was driving home. Um, Tom, what were you? Th what are your main thoughts? Because you were meant to come with me, and you couldn't get up to to Guildford because you know train line were down. Yeah, I just think it was just a, another poor showing from another football club in terms of considering uh, the travel arrangements of supporters uh, and that, that probably counts for home fans as well I'm sure there are some South End fans just like town there's, there's, I'm sure there's some South End fans who travel from further than South End Town Centre uh, if I'd have travelled up with you by the time the game had been called off I'd have been halfway there from where I was travelling from uh, if not more uh, and that would have cost me a fair bit of money. Am I going to get my am I going to get my money back basically from South End uh, on my petrol? I got to Rickmansworth, which is fifty miles, so a good hundred mile round trip, you know, along the M25. Who doesn't want to spend their day watching planes struggle? Actually, I was basically got a live view of Big Jet TV, so you know, I was well ahead of the curve in terms of the country. Um, it's a bit surprising. There aren't many games games where you get this sort of level of warning and this sort of level of hyperbole. And I think that's a bit different. Some fans are sort of making comparisons to the game we had at Boreham, at home against Boreham Wood, where uh, the Finder stand decided to to give up the ghost a little bit uh, and throw stuff into the car park. Um, hopefully, it was aiming for an Aston Martin. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's a it's an interesting one, really. Where in terms of I was disappointed in the way it was led. It's an opportunity to be quite active, proactive, to say, look, and even if you just wanted to say, look, we're going to do our best to get this game to go ahead, get on with it. Um, it looks like the worst of it will pass. And if the stadium stands up to the rigours of it, then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead with it. But if you are a town fan travelling down and you don't feel it's what we, we would suggest not to, you can have a refund on your ticket. Uh, because obviously if the game had gone ahead, no one would have been able to... to uh, to get their, their money back. I was a bit disappointed in how it was all leveraged out, really. I don't know if my point is worthwhile or not. 
Well, you can get a refund on your ticket, can't you, if the game is called off? It's it is the travel costs and the time that's the 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 main problem. And you cited the Boreham Wood game at home. I also travelled up from Portsmouth for the Boreham Wood game, oh. uh, and got I was in I was in Cleethorpes on the the morning of that game, having travelled up the night before. I think the difference with um, with the Boreham Wood game was that they they want a red weather warning before, was there? Yeah, was... and I think that's what I think that's what makes it different for me. Is like the Met Office say, "Look, you could die." <laughs> yeah, there's there's two, there's two separate points, really, isn't there? There's the normal uh, postponement of games when the weather's bad. You know, you do all you can to get a game on, and then maybe the pitch. Uh, it doesn't respond well to it or, you know, something happens at the staging. But this was completely different. I mean, the Met Office issuing a, a red weather warning. I mean, to to call it off at four o'clock, three hours before before kickoff, when you've had so much notice, is a bit of a ridiculous thing to do. We, we could all sort of see that that was going to happen. And all they've done by keeping the game and trying to get the game on is they, they've given an event for fans to try and travel to when it's probably advisable they don't. Yeah. Yeah, and on top of that, I don't understand why they couldn't have just moved the game to Saturday afternoon when there was loads of games on. Uh, the team, like obviously, town were already down there. I don't really think it would have been a massive problem for them to stay on another twenty-four hours. Like that, that that would have been the best solution, and we they didn't find that so. Do you think it's a at least it's an advantage? Uh, Maguire Drew is able to sort of have a little bit more match fitness before we face one of the informed teams in the league at the moment. Given, I mean, irrespective of Southend's current position. Um, well, I, I mean, it, it keeps keeps the run on, doesn't it? Instead of facing an informed Southend team. I mean, one point I, I would raise is I'm I'm amazed things like this are still in the hands of the football club. I mean, when you've got a national weather warning like that, why local authorities and and people in charge of local areas are not sort of taking that decision out of out of commercial businesses' hands is yeah, it's very similar to when there's a big snowstorm and the pitch is fine, but they're saying, "Look, get into the ground is a bit of a pain." And everyone, will, there'll be you know local news reporters out there putting a camera on a bit of ice and watching everyone <laughs> fall on their ass. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's that's what we can say about that. Thank you so many for your questions. But we got the main event. Josh Allen is going to be with us in a second. Uh, I'm going to press one of these fancy transition buttons. Uh, and then we'll be back with you in a couple of seconds. Uh, see you then. Okay, it doesn't make any noise, so I can talk all over it. So it now looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I should put that's, music on it. That's the budget gone, isn't it? That's the budget. We can't afford, you know, royalty-free music. That's that's. <laughs> you can sing, mate. The podcast, the podcast tune took, cost twenty quid. I think when we bought it for the first time, we got our money's worth out of it. Uh, <laughs> just as long as John Moore doesn't ask for any for his commentary over the front of it. Josh, it is a pleasure to uh, welcome you to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. How you doing, you alright? Yeah, not too bad, man. Not too bad at all, really. Um, uh, you know, Saturdays without a game are frustrating, but you know, you're not going to be dis- disappointed at least. Yeah, no, we had a game yesterday, so um, I'm not as disappointed as you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a really interesting one, really. So, how did did you know your game was going to go ahead, really, and there was no issues with it? I guess everything was was fine, was it? Yeah, I mean, we we got there. There was um, obviously because of the weather. I mean, getting there was a nightmare. It took me four hours to get to Chester on a two hour forty minute journey. So, um, and the coach got there late, so we had to delay kick off fifteen minutes. But it was just really, really windy. To be honest, it, it stopped raining when we got there. The pitch was heavy in certain areas, but I mean, the Chester, the, the Chester grounds room done excellent to get the game on. But it was just, just the windy, it was really just windy conditions more than anything. But it's not a bad journey home, is it? After a, a, a it wasn't last minute, I guess, but a late, a late winner. Frustrating because we conceded from two set plays, and obviously as a centre half, um, <laughs> corners. Kind of got my nerves a little bit, but no, um, we, we see it starts it form now, the right right point of the season, and we're scoring goals now, and um, which is pleasing. So, yeah, I mean, going to Chester, I think they've lost um, before our game. They've only lost two home games, so going there and getting a victory there with with that kind of home form they've got was um, really pleasing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, as long as you weren't managing that Cheltenham Wickham five or draw yesterday, I imagine your frustrations as a centre half. I, am, I, <laughs> I, I mean, it's we've had quite a few questions come in, and I've got to thank you because we've got nothing to talk about today. So it's been great. We were talking about having you on, and 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 thank yeah. you so much for jumping on late. I mean, I guess the first question is sort of. What are your abiding memories of the town? And then we'll go into we'll go into the sort of the questions. What are, of your time here? What can you? What were your most memorable experiences, really? At the club or at Grimsby? Both. Yeah. Let's do both. I'm slightly worried well, about the Grimsby one. Let's do the club. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it was probably obviously. Uh, well, the third thing was I started with kind of sadness, I suppose, of coming on loan and. Um, I remember we were doing sprints um, the, the the year we lost in, in the final. We, we had a sprint relay. for I don't know why we had a sprint relay a week before the final, but we had a sprint relay a bit of fun enough. I, I pulled my hammy. Um, so I had a great two tear in my hammy. So I was like, so that was on the um, in the week. And then on the Monday, I was out trying to jog, like trying to convince myself that I'd be fit for the game, which I never was going to be. Um, and then obviously coming to the final and, and seeing obviously JP step up and Mr. Penalty and the sadness in the squad, I just had to stay. I think it was a big thing for me to get back there and, and win. And, and you know, that that's what the season was about. And it was just an, uh, an, a magical season. Obviously, the, the semi-finals first leg didn't go as well as I'd like to give the penalty away. So, uh, <laughs> but um, no it was just, yeah, we knew when we won the Braintree game, we knew we'd win, we, we were going to get promoted. We just knew. Because it was, we hadn't scored a goal against Braintree all season. Um, and we just knew it was such a tough task. So we went there, we won, and we just knew we'd won the final already even before we got there. I, 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 one question about that brain, brain trip. It was an incredible game, but I still think I've got heat stroke from that, that match. Oh, I don't my, think I've been in a hotter well, game. I couldn't speak. It, it was just horrendous. It was the hottest day ever. <laughs> so it didn't help. <laughs> it, 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 was, it, was, it was so odd, and especially in an open territory. Like, uh, there was a lot of uh, bright red, um, heads, I imagine, the next day. Yeah, um, obviously, with me having a radiator on my head, it didn't help on that day. <laughs> <laughs> we should, you should have said we'd have thrown loads of water over you, it'd have been fine. I guess, did you have options to move then in, in 2015? Then were there, were there options to sort of maybe jump to a higher level? What when I came to Grimsby, yeah, after, after sort of, yeah, did you have an opportunity to, to move up again in that before yeah, that season? I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, but obviously, look, like I said, what happened happened. So I just wanted to, I didn't finish business. So I wanted to kind of finish off what we started. So I was never going to go anywhere. I mean, we're relieved. Tom, have you got anything to ask while I have a quick look through? I think that some of these questions are pretty good. I have got loads of questions, Josh. Um, <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> uh, well, firstly, just going back to some uh, recent news, uh, you were linked with the Boston United job. Uh, just before Christmas, I think it was. Uh, were you ever close to going to Pilgrim Way? Um, oh, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, obviously, yeah, I, I know I was linked with a job. Um, obviously, I'm, I was firmly focused on what we're doing at Hereford and the project we're doing there. So um, it's nice to be linked with jobs. Um, Boston's obviously at our level. You know, it's a good club. It's got a big budget. Um, it's got a new stadium. It, it's um, obviously a club that wants to go places. Um, so it's nice to get linked with it, but for, from my point of view, um, you know, I never had any contact with them. You know, I was firmly focused on my job and what I was doing. Very good. Okay. And then I'm going to rattle through my questions because why good, not? Um, what is, I don't, I haven't watched any Hereford games, I'm afraid, this year. Um, I mean, out but... of all of us, that that is the most surprising. If there was anyone that would have done. <laughs> uh, but I'd, I'd like to know what your opinion is about uh, playing out from the back as a coach uh, from a goal kick. So, you know, when people get the ball at a goal kick and you get the, normally the two full backs uh, or the two centre backs drop to the edge of the 18 yard box and the full backs push on. Um, it seems to sort of, especially in the lower leagues, it seems to really polarise opinion. I was just wondering, uh, from a coaching perspective, what your opinion is on playing out from the back. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they, they have them either side of the six yard box, don't they? And then playing out. Yeah. From my point of view, I mean, I watched the Swindon game against was it Man City? Yeah. Did it, and I'm like, you're playing against the back best pressing team, 
probably one of the best pressing teams in the world and you're playing out in the secure box and you're in League One or League Two, whatever league you're in. So, um, yeah, I we don't do that. So, I, I just think um, the National League is very much a second ball league. Obviously, it's possession-based with some teams, but I just feel, you know, the players, no disrespect to the players, but we're not in the Premier League where, you know, the players have got that real quality to, to, to open up teams. And teams will do it at times and, and they'll get away with it. But for me, the risk versus reward is just not there. So I would much rather play a bit more direct and then get the ball down and play once we, you know, get our motion going, once we've got a piece of second ball. So that's how I see it. We rub our hands together, to be honest. When teams set up their two centre-halves in the secure box, because of the way we press, we're like, go on then. And then we'll just press, press the living dead outside. And they'll break for our press sometimes, but the times they won't. Uh, the risk for us is, is well worth it because all of a sudden you're in, you're in and amongst the 18 yard box. They've got two centre halves either side. They've got two full backs on the halfway line, and you just one v one or two v two. So, yeah, we we definitely don't do that. Okay, and then continuing the the tactical theme. Um, this last week, I've been watching uh, the Last Dance uh, about the uh, Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan yeah. on Netflix. And I was wondering if, as a coach, you take any inspiration for set pieces, phases of play or training from other sports. Because I've always thought that, uh, with basketball in particular, um, there is potential to sort of imitate some of their um, play, their plays from dead ball situations yeah. in footballs, especially, for example, throw-ins. Yeah. Yeah, so I know the last time's well. So we name all our seasons. Um, so this season for us was called the Elevation. So it's about elevating. We did everything from last year um, because we. Just, I just feel like we need a clear focus for the season. Um, so we do that. Now, um, I look at a lot of American football stuff, so the footwork and the movements. Um, in football, you do quite a lot of linear stuff, but you don't do lateral movement, sideways, backwards, all that stuff. You don't do a lot of that movement. So... I definitely look at, I do look at a lot of that and um, my strength and conditioning coach make sure he does that and when I look at basketball when you look at phases of play you know someone will have a shot it might be a corner one of his and then they break so quickly and if yeah. you look at our team we're very expansive when we defended from a, a set play well we need to defend set plays bad for a start anyway but we won't go into that but when we win the ball back we just break you know with real intensity and purpose so yeah we I definitely look at all sports I think we need to and um, a lot of sports do look at other sports and I think football is catching up slowly with other sports, but I think it's still got quite a long way to go with that. Okay. Can I, um, can I ask you a question on that one? Sorry, Tom. No, In terms sorry. Of you've, you've now got a, a unique perspective being both a, a manager and, and, and a former player. Now we, we've obviously got new owners within the in the club. Yeah. As a player and now as a manager, what would you think would be the first things you picked up on thinking back to 2016, 2017, what would you want to have made changes at, at Blundell Park in terms of, so, I mean, for me, the biggest from... thing at the club, for me, if you look at the community star side of things, we need to be in the community more. The football club needs to grow more. Um, there's some great people at the football club, but if you look at Lincoln, dare I say, talk about them. Um, Put him off, have... Tom. I know, yeah. I was captain there as well, so I talk about <laughs> But what they have done is they have branched out into the community massively. And and I think that's paid dividends with the tendencies they get at the football club. Now, I know our tendencies were brilliant. This, I have been brilliant this year. But I just feel the football club can do more in the community, I, I feel. I think there's there's lots of scope. There's In this town, it's just football. They just absolutely love it. And I just think that possibly the club could do a lot more. And I, I'm not sure how much they do now. But obviously, when I was there, I just felt that, that we're missing a trick. Is there anything in particular you'd like to see them do to reach out to you? Because, so, for example, Tom, actually, come to think of it, all of us have, I don't think any of us have lived in Grimsby. You're probably the closest to it. No, I've um, lived in Grimsby. Oh, did you? I didn't, I didn't know that. So Tom yeah, is from yeah. uh, Skegness. Mike is down here in, in, in London and I'm in Surrey. And though we've all lived around the town, there has never been necessarily, I don't think there was much interaction outside of North East Lincolnshire. So like looking at Caister and, and Louth and places like that that sort of evaporate. I used to live in Caister. That's where I lived when I was... I live in Grimsby now. Yeah, yeah. How's... Yeah. Um, what did you make of Caister then? It was, just, it was nice. It was really quiet. So 
I was like, I was like the only black man in the village. So yeah, it was good. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Going, yeah, that's actually probably true. <laughs> no, I loved it. There were great people there. I just liked to be out of the way and, and just be quiet and just get on about my business. So it was nice to there, and it was a good route into into Grimsby. So no, I really enjoyed it there. Unless it snowed. Unless it snowed, <laughs> then, then you're all screwed. I was going nowhere. <laughs> That's that's really interesting. And then, sort of, as a player, did you think there was anything else? So, we interviewed James McEwen in the in uh, in the summer, and Maka was saying one of the things that he was really surprised at in the changes is that he goes into the changing room now, even at uh, even at Cheapside, and his kit's laid out and it's all pressed, it's all cleaned up. And he said, and he said, I think he said, Christ, I feel like an actual professional footballer for once. Uh, is is there anything else like that from your experiences, uh, like you would love to have seen changed as a player? Um, it was a pretty, I, I would like to see the tra- training ground have a bit more kind of, because obviously we, we didn't have a gym. Well, we've got a gym, but it's like a portal cabin. Um, so it wasn't really, I mean, the equipment wasn't really conducive to do the proper workout. So you'd have to go to a gym. And I know the club are thinking about spending money on that. And I just think strength, strength and conditioning nowadays, I mean, if you look at the National League, it's a big league. You know, the, the players are big, physical, strong, quick. I'd like to see a bit more probably invested in that area. Um, I would have at the time, to be honest, because I spent all my days in the gym. I wasn't the biggest anyway, but and that's why I spent my time in the gym. So I think probably that side of the thing um, would be good. Obviously, they've brought an SNC coach on now. I think um, the analysis side of things and the data side of things, um, we didn't really do. Um, and that's massive now. So I, I definitely would have liked to have seen that um, when I was there. Tom, you were going to ask a follow-up question. I'm really sorry. I interrupted you and then took it away. No, that's fine. Um Used My <laughs> last question was, uh, as someone who's involved in professional football, uh, where do you see the game headed in the next 20 years? Do you think that the European Super League was perhaps a missed opportunity for the lower leagues rather than uh, what it's been portrayed as, which was a victory? Um, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I think... If you have breakaway leagues, I think it's always going to have a detriment to... I think it would be a detriment to Premier League, to be honest. I think if you look at like the German model, and I know Ben Minnie would get involved in it, but obviously their whole thing is geared around the league producing players for the national team. And I just feel that we need to... The problem with the English DNA is that we will do it for a period and it won't work and then we'll follow another, another country. But the top of the pyramid is the Premier League and they are not looking to bring any young English players through. They're looking to, to get the best players from abroad everywhere to come into the league and spend loads of, and just make loads of money. So from my point of view, it'd be nice to see, not, not taking the Premier League away, but make it a bit more nationalised so that we can start bringing players through. And because we have got some really good young talent, you know, especially in, in, in some of the academies. Now you have an under 23 system where these lads have never played men's football. You've got 22 year olds that have never kicked a, a ball in a man's game in his life. You know, we've we, we had a lad who went from a championship club, centre-half, can't head a ball. Because in 23s, it is literally passing out of the jail box, playing around, getting through. And I'm sure you've seen some of them at Grimsby where all of a sudden they're calling the Mets game and they really struggle. And I'd like to see that system change because when I come through, it was reserves. So the lads that didn't play on a Saturday for the first team played in the reserves. Now, if you were good enough as an 18-year-old to play in the reserves, you were playing against men. You know, and I'll play against, you know, players like Chris Armstrong and people like that. And that was my education. So I'd like to see football get back to that way. But the reality is football is no times and that's what it's about. So if the if the Super League is going to j- generate more money for football, then I think it will go that way, um, which is sad. Um, but uh, wherever the money goes is where football is going, I think. I think we had some of those defenders last season that couldn't end up all. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Mike? <laughs> yeah, so just to, just to link into what Josh is saying about youth development, I mean, last season especially, and a little bit this season, we've heard an awful lot about um, bigger teams not wanting to send their academy players out because of COVID, and then that keeps them keeps their numbers lower. Just wondering if that's something that's just unique to us, or it's something you've seen lower down the pyramid. And also, how do you think that's going to going to affect those players now that for the last couple of seasons they've not really been able to get out and play that football? Um, and for a team that um, in the National League North, have you then had to find some different ways, like blood your youth youth players a lot more, or find a new innovative way to get around that, not having the 
the lone players? So um, it, it, it's weird. So you have a system in England currently where you have under 23 not all managers, but they have an under 23s team and they want their best players because they want to not necessarily look good, but they want to win games. So it's that detriment to the players. So what we found was that during the COVID period, they just, because the thing is we're, we're not full time. So for us, it, it impacted us massively getting loan players because the reality is now when you know COVID's still here, but the restrictions are a lot less, you can bring a player in, you can train with you twice a week and then go back to his club and train there. So all of a sudden, what it meant was that we just couldn't get any loan players in for full-time clubs because they they were missing training days. So it impacted us massively. So then we went kind of into the market and, you know, I'm obviously big on data um, with transfers and all that stuff. And we, we started looking at players that just didn't have clubs. They were waiting, they didn't have clubs. So then you can bring all these players in on non-contracts and that's what we had to do. But I think it's definitely impacted young lads uh, because they've just been sitting around kind of waiting um, not playing games and just sitting there and there, there's I mean youth teams at Premier League clubs they've got like 50 kids they can't all play so th there's kids there that have, that have probably spent a year two years and literally not kicked a ball and it's it's really alarming for their development and I just think if you look at the drop off rate of you know players at that level I mean what 1% make it so where did the rest go and, and, it, and it's really alarming when they've not played any football then they have to come to our levels but they're not physically ready or mentally ready to come into men's football and a ball get thrown up in the air and a big center run off come through and how about you in the air? Like, it's just not ready for it, unfortunately. So, I think that's where you find such a big drop-off rate. But also the wages. You know, you've got some 19-year-olds that are on 10 grand a week and never played men's football. Then they get released and they come down to the National League level and again, £500 a week. It's just, yeah. I mean, more needs to be done. I know Palace started doing something recently with um, players after football, I've seen um, some stuff on that, but there definitely needs to be a better way of, of filling these players in, into the men's game. Did you, um, speaking of sort of data, this is really quite, I don't know how this sounds really outdated now, actually talking about money ball and stuff, but what 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 is football's on-base percentage? What is that unknown statistic that revolutionised football? I guess it's it must have been found by now. Because it, it can't be as easy as cricket and baseball to, to potentially find. Is there one? No, I just think everyone has their own ways. Um, so we, we, well, I am creating our own um, system. Um, so, you know, I just believe with where we're at and uh, financially, we have to be really stringent with all our, you know, rec our recruitment. And, and for me, we're building a, a data set. You can get statistics off wide scale all day, past completions, all that stuff, um, and they're very generic data. This is generic data um, that anyone can get. Now, a past completion to you might be a completely past completion, completely different to me. So, what what we're doing is building our own database, uh, building our own set of data around our identity, so that when we're making decisions on players, um, we're one seeing them obviously scouting them and stuff, but then it also... I think sometimes your eyes can lie. Now, the reality is, as a manager, I can go and see a player and he plays amazing. I think, I want him. And then I'll go and see him again two or three times and he plays amazing. But there's another 40 games that season. Now, it might be that I've just seen him three times and he was good those three times. So, for us, we're coming up with a data set that, one, fits in with our identity and the way we play, but also they're statistically the best players at that level that may, may go under the radar because they might not be the most fashionable. So we're creating that and, and we're creating a system with that. So I, I'm, it's in place pretty much now. Obviously, we've had a period where we need to collect the data, of course, and the data still gets collected, but it will inform our recruitment uh, come the end of the season on the players we, we, we bring in. Do you do you think that, that statistics now play on a player's mind? Say, for example, you, you look at pass completion rate. A player is so aware of that, he would be more inclined to make the safe pass then maybe play the ball into the channel or try and break through the lines. Do you think that is at all an issue or am I just making that up off the top of my head? No, I think it, it, look, it comes down to the way you kind of word your, with the word your data. So I've been pulled in office before and gone, your pass completion rate is 40%. And I've gone, okay. And I've gone, and I've gone but a pass completion is me to pass to you and that's a pass completion. Now, during the game, I might get a ball down. You might work on your throw-ins. So we might work on our throw-ins in the final third. So as a centre-half, I might get the ball and drop a ball in the channel and they kick it out in the final third for a throw-in. 
we do a throw in and score from the throw in, but my pass completion rate's down because of, it's, it's not going to be a penalty that's gone to the opposition. So it, it depends how the manager sees that data. So is he looking at the data? Is he looking at the game? What's the understanding of that data? And how does he then frame it to the players? So, and, and I just think the way we are here is it's risk versus reward and it's finding a happy balance. So if I've got a player that his completion rate is 40%, but we have got the game with a free pass in the last minute of the game and he's been trying those passes all game and he finally did one, we won 1-0. I'm not going to come at the end of the game and go, your participation rate is 40%. You're not good enough. You're not playing. So it's just how you see that data and how you use it to affect and to affect the players. So I think that's a big thing. Because it can be scary, of course. So if you come in at the end and you've gone, well, your participation rate is 40%, then the player's going to be like, I'm giving the ball away 60% of the time. It's going to be an issue. But I think it's just how you you word that to the player and how you look at yourself as, you know, the top of the pyramid. Perfect. Tom? And then I'll, we'll go to the question as well. Anybody who wants to add a question, feel free to do it on, on the live part as well. I'll um, I'll wrangle them through. What were you going to say, Tom? I've got a couple of questions, Josh. Firstly, just going back to where you mentioned uh, the identity of a club there. Um, I don't know if Podge ever mentioned it when you were playing together. Uh, but in GAA, uh, there was a, a, a manager of the Dublin football team called Jim Gavin who said that a team could never play the same style more than two seasons on a trot because yeah. other teams would eventually become aware of those tactics and be able to, to counter them. Uh, so when you're talking about identity of a football club, how, to what extent do you think that you can implement an identity and that just that be the way they play or do you see identity slightly different to that? I see it different. So I see so we have the core beliefs. So we have core beliefs and values, second balls, um, restarts, um, pressing, all that stuff. So within that is our identity. And then we have, so that is our kind of DNA. There are fundamentals, there are non-negotiables that lads have to live by. Kind of pressing, pressing, uh, accountability, all that stuff. So that's what we live by. Now, we have a clear way of playing, but within that, we have tweaks to it. So we can play in different ways and we can kind of adapt it, but the core values stay the same. So, you know, you look at us at the start of the season, the first 10 games, I think we were in one. Um, now, why was that? Was that because we were playing, we had to, well, we had two centre midfielders playing centre half and we were really expansive. We had both our fullbacks going forward and then all of a sudden, players are turning balls in behind and we get, we're getting done. But we've got a clear system, so we can tweak our system within that. So maybe we don't get a fullback to the high, or maybe we get a centre midfielder rolling in between the fullback and the centre half, which enables when the transition turns over, we've got a midfield in a good defensive area. So what I would say is it, it has to, it can't be too rigid. I think it has to be fluid, but I think you have to have your fundamentals and your key beliefs behind it. Um, and, and, and I really do believe that. But I also believe that you have to have other ways of playing football. You have to have other formations. You have you have to have you know like our midfield. We play two and a one, and at times we play in a one and a two, and at times we want our two wide players to stay wide, and at times we want them to run inside and our tend to run in behind. So we're quite fluid in the sense that we look at the opposition um, and look at their weaknesses and try and exploit their weaknesses within the way we play. So so we're not always it's not easy just to turn around and go well they just do that so we'll do that and we'll just nullify it. So I, I think it is important to be as fluid as possible within your beliefs. And then my last question, which is uh, not really related to anything we've been talking about. Uh, you're obviously really close to the Welsh border with your team. Um, and a former Grimsby Town manager uh, or assist caretaker manager, Anthony Limbrick, is currently manager at TNS. Uh, do you think that the, the top level of Welsh football... Um, is a backward step for people coming from non-league in England, or do you think it can actually be a stepping stone to to something to something better? It is a difficult one, isn't it? Because we played TNS last year when they were just going before their Champions League or Europa League game, and we beat them two 0 um, And it's it's a it's, it's a different type of football. I think it's very technical. It's slower, um, but you, you are, I mean. What can I say? They're going in Europa League qualifiers and Champions League qualifiers. So, you know, the standard is good. Um, I think it's. I think it would be good 
to go into there because it's a very more technical league. So you, it, it, all these are different, aren't they? But the reality is you need to be in a job to have the opportunity to go somewhere else. And that's the reality of it. So I know Anthony did well here and obviously he's gone over he's gone over there. But you need to work at the end of the day. And, and there are some good teams at that level, you know, TMS, uh, Connor Keys and a, a few of the clubs that have got a lot of money and, and they spend big to, to, to try and do things right. So, you know, who am I to say that isn't set down? Are you in competition with teams like TNS and Connors Key for, for players at Hereford financially? No. So um, what I did, I, I, I made the kind of decision when I took over to move the training base. Um, so we trained in Gloucester um, at, uh, at night times. And for me, coming from full-time football to then going to train, as a, I was a player at the time, uh, in Gloucester at night, the transition was too much for me. And I was getting home at 12 o'clock at night, training twice a week. It just, it, I just couldn't deal with it. So my first thing when I um, got the job on a permanent basis was the reality is we're in the National League North. Now, why are we training in the South when we're playing all our games in the North? It makes no sense. So we had a big budget. We were spending a ridiculous amount of money on expenses for players from the North to travel down to training. So we just changed it. My budget got stripped, of course. So what I had to do was work, think on my feet, on my feet. So we moved the training base to Birmingham which was a much more central location. It's where we train now. Uh, we get a better pool of player. We get a better quality of player for less money. And that's the reality of it. And it's a good catchment area. It's a big football club. But one of the problems with the club was when you ask people to come in, it's like, well, Hereford's a long way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a long way. And, you know, I'd rather go to a team around the corner that I could play week in, week out and get similar money than travel three hours to, to, to Hereford. So... It just changed the whole dynamics of what we did. We trained in the morning, so we're still part time, but we trained two mornings a week. So what 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 that enables us to do is get some of the professionals that you know in the football league or the league above that still want to be professional, but for whatever reason they've, that they they can't find a club. So the transition is is they're still training twice a week, so which which helps massively. And then you know that we we have a buy in, so the lads have to do a certain amount of distances um, per week. They're not in because it's important that I get the right group of players at the football club. So they all buy into it. If they don't get the distances in, they get fined. Um, if they don't get the distances on a Saturday, they get fined. So, you know, I want a core group of players that want to work for me, want to work for the football club and, and want to be better. And uh, we've been able to do that by um, changing the training base. Nice. We had a, we had an interesting question on the, that from a, a fan that says, similar to Hurst, you're, you're managing a club that, feels it's below its natural level what issues yeah. does that present i.e i guess pressure from home fans to to perform or is there anything else as well that you find i, I think coming into now when you say it's below its level in in terms of what would say about hereford in terms of fans yes in terms of finances no so we are where we are so in terms of finances this is where we should be so, and yes, fan base, we're a big football club, but financially we're not. So, and, and that's, that's uh, getting people to understand that when we've had big money before in the past and, and we're not there now is, is tough because obviously when you're not doing well, like we were at the start of the season, it's like, well, you got to get this player, you got to get that player, you got to do this, you got to do that when you don't have it. So you have to be more diligent with your signings. You have to create an identity for the football club that you can tweak and, and, and evolve. You have to work tirelessly in the community that like I do. I spend a lot of time in the community doing projects to, to engage the fans to make sure they come because I think there's, there was, there's, there's been a disconnect with Hereford with the fans for a while. Um, and it was my job when I took over to, to rebuild that, bridge that gap and get the, the fans back in at the football club. And, you know, that's what we've worked on with. The, we let go of the youth team. So we've brought the youth team back. Um, we've imprinted, I've, I've imprinted our DNA on the youth team and we're, we're going to have college programmes and we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in the community to, to really bridge that gap. And the big thing as well is when you look at finances, we need to be sustainable with just not gate receipts, but actually other things outside of the game that makes the club sustainable, which gives me more of a budget. So, you know, we're trying to build a football club. We, we went from being our business to reformed, to promotions back, back to back, back to back, back to back. And then all of a sudden we hit the National League North level and you've got big clubs, York, Chester, Boston, all these clubs that have got more money than you and we haven't built the infrastructure of the football club. So, and that's what we're doing now. And I think 
we will be a big football club and we will get back to where we need to go. But that takes time and it takes patience. And I think sometimes that's the biggest thing um, from for me as a manager is that, you know, our expectation levels from our fans are up there. But the reality of it, we've got a lot of building to do at the football club, which means I need time. So and it's, 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 it's managing that and managers don't have time a lot of the time. And, you know, after 10 games, we got to Wembley last year and after 10 games this season, people are like, it ain't working. We need to change it. I'm like, just relax. It's coming. <laughs> so it's just probably just having a bit of time really is the biggest thing um, to really improve what you want to do at the football club. But yeah, it is difficult. There is pressure. There's pressure from obviously when clubs come and, you know, things aren't going well on a match day and, and the fans will, will get on your back. But what I would say is, our fans this season have been absolutely outstanding. From, you know, the first 10 games we had when we haven't really won any, well, we'd win one. They cheered us off every week. They clapped us, They, you know, because we play a good style of football. So, you know, that's been pleasing. But you just have to, I, I think, if you if you love a football club, um, then the staff have all got to be involved in the football club, involved in the community. And, and really that makes the fans buy into the football club and buy into you and what you're trying to do because they see the passion for it. And I think that's a real big thing and a, and a, and a big plus for us. But obviously, it's what needs to happen at, at clubs that are probably at a level where they could probably go again. Right, it's time for the it's time for the questions from fans. So we'll we'll no, we'll avoid for the, the we'll, <laughs> we'll avoid the questions at the moment of Gullies or O'Neills or uh, Popwell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I guess. Um, so Michael asked, and this was probably the, the one of the is one of two of the highest voted. The other one's quite funny. Uh, after getting us promoted, did you think the nucleus of the squad would be kept together, or was it expected? Uh, I, 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 I agree with Mike, but let's be Fen, uh, Fenty would penny pinch in the contracts offered. Were you surprised with how quickly the the team was sort of pulled apart, or was it expected after promotion? I've never said this, but coming back the year after we got promoted was the worst feeling of my career really because wow we got promoted we were like brothers we had a squad we worked for a manager that we obviously we worked tirelessly for we deserved to be in league two with that team and when i come back in the summer and there was loads of new faces some of them attitudes weren't great um it was disheartening disheartening to be honest and it was and it was sad and I was angry, if I'm going to be honest, because we'd worked so hard. And what people don't understand about this football club is the pressure that season for us to get promoted was unbelievable. And the relief, it was more relief. And we know what it meant to the town. And to get promoted, we just, it was just, just like we were gods. And then all of a sudden, you go into the next season, where you go into pre-season on the first day and you look around and there's four, four of your mates from the team that got promoted was just heartbreaking, to be honest. Absolutely heartbreaking. Was it was it a surprise that that Hurst left? I guess with that sort of attitude, that must have permutated around the building. So an option like Shrewsbury comes up, you can kind of understand, I guess. Yeah, I just think it's a it's a great football club, isn't it? If we're gonna be honest about it. New stadium, real big history. You know, it, if it was a player, would, would, would we be a good player moving up to that level? We wouldn't, would we? So, I mean, he, he had the opportunity to go and, and obviously gone then and excellent, didn't he? So his kind of decision was vindicated, wasn't it? So, but no, I um, I know we you hear about things that are rumbling in the background and, and, and you're not sure whether or not people are getting on or not getting on or what it was. So we heard those things and obviously he moved on and it was this, it was just, just disappointing. It was just a disappointing season, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you still you still finished pretty strongly in that season, given all the change that was there. Um, it's, I, I don't think we even finished higher than that after, did we, Mike? No, uh, no. no. <laughs> not by a long way, mate. Yeah, I, I think that team, if we had get our team together, we would have had a right go at League Two, we would have. Agreed. A right go. Yeah. I really believe with a couple of additions, we would have had a right go at League Two. And there's, what, four teams go up? we were at a right chance. I, I generally believe that because the team spirit, we we're absolutely buzzing. I mean, we're still in a group chat now. That team has still got That's a group amazing. chat. That's amazing. So, is it the see... same, is it the same one from 2016? Yeah. Is it... That's amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so right now, I still speak to a couple of lads now, Peter, uh, Omar, uh, JP, 
who I say Maka, I speak to them all, so we we all still speak. So yeah, I just, I just think it, we deserved a year to have a go, and if it didn't work out, then yeah, make changes. But I just think we deserved it. Yeah, I, I I I can't I can't not agree wholeheartedly, and, and it, I think it was it was certainly the beginning of the end of that bloke. Tom, what are you saying? You're waving like you're drowning. You speak to Omar. Where the fuck is he? Why isn't he back here? <laughs> have a word, Josh. Have a word. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> there's, some, there's something about Hardyball. <laughs> <laughs> He, he he started making his way to the east coast. He he found a shop with all the sh- uh, he found a town with all the shops shut, and he just yeah. assumed he was back in Grimsby. <laughs> I, I have got a, a question though, Josh. Um, so when uh, Paul Hurst and Rob Scott first came to town, one of the things that I thought they would bring with them from Boston United was like a really solid set piece game. Uh, I actually watch Boston quite a bit because uh, yeah. I grew up near Skegness, and I, even though I am a Grimsby Town fan, Boston, as I was growing up, was like my second team. Um, and for me, they've never really brought that really solid set piece game to town. Uh, as a player, did you think that, that that was something that actually was worked on a lot? And for whatever reason, the fans don't see it. Or do you think that it's something that maybe could have been played on more? Yeah, well, I think we could probably could have done it more. I think the National League is, you know, a big part of big part of the National League. The balls out of play a ridiculous amount of times. You know, there's a big, ridiculous amount of throw-ins, ridiculous amount of free kicks and, and corners, and we probably could have. Um, but we got promoted, <laughs> so it's, it's one of them, isn't it? It's, do you do work really low on, on set plays and, and then it, it takes away concentration at other levels? You're just getting that balance, I suppose. But I just thought, you know, the team we had was just dynamic. It, it could solve problems in-game itself. Uh, we had a really mature team and, and you know, we went from strength to strength. But yeah, we prob- probably could have done a little bit more, to be fair, probably. But Is it something new. that you really concentrate on at, at Hereford, for example? Well, I can say that, but we can we can see the two from a from a corner on Saturday, so <laughs> I'm not, so sure. not necessarily I'm from checking the Hereford message board. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Um, what about year, from like an attacking point of view, though? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the final, if you look at the final at Wembley, we worked on a few set plays and we scored from one in, in yeah. the final. So we do. Um, I use my stuff well. So Jan um, Kikowski does our set plays, so he'll go away and, and look at them, and um, we we'll look at set plays. We work on throw-ins tirelessly. Um, I'm I'm very big on throw-ins and keeping possession um, of the ball with throw-ins. So we work on a lot of that stuff. So, you know, we want to be the best restart team. That's one of our remits. So um, we probably come away from that a little bit of late. So we need to get back to it a little bit. But I just think the National League level, we start to everything. I've got a, a question, Josh, sort of linking back into something you said a minute ago about the, the pressure and how how tight tight that 2016 squad was. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that after that first leg at Braintree, um, where we lost one nil at home, there was a bit of I criticism. I give rightly, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, there's a lot of criticism. I want it back. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just really wondering how did how did that affect the squad? Because I mean, you looked at uh, Disley after the second leg, and there seemed to be a lot of emotion about getting getting through and coming over that into the second leg. I'm just wondering how was the how was the squad after that first leg? How did it affect Paul? Did you use it as a motivation? Um. I think, you know, I can't speak for Paul because I don't know, but obviously I know the Cup of the Year thing was a, a big thing with the fans and it's obviously, it's obviously played on his mind when we won because he did it. So um, for us, it was, uh, uh, we knew it, we knew what was there, um, but we also knew the pressure of that season to go up and we knew that and, and I think that was a big thing. So going into the game, it was it was a pressure cooker. To be honest, the Braintree game, like I said, we've not scored a goal against them all season. We lost one nil at home, and you, you want to go, you want to play at home and, and take a lead going into Braintree. Um, but you know what? We just believed, and we just believed that we'd stick at it, we'd, we'd get a breakthrough. And when we did, when it came, obviously we we're buzzing. And at the end of the game, that's why I say at the end of the game, the final was imitated. It, it, we knew we were going to win the final because that was our final. Because of the pressure, because of obviously what gone on with Hursty. Because of obviously the the the, the way we just hadn't beat Braintree all season, 
we just knew if we'd win that game, we'd get to the final. And, and we'd heard also that Forest Green weren't wearing their suits because they wanted to wear it after they won the final. So that oh, was wow. a bit, yeah, a little bit more spice to it. So yeah, I wish you could have told the rest of us, mate. You'd have so, so, saved a lot of nerves on that day. You should have just told <laughs> us you were going to win. To be honest, we were. Well, we tuned in up. It went in at half time. We were like, yeah, this is easy. And then we come out second half and he put one of the top pins. And I was like, oh, my squeaky bomb time. <laughs> <laughs> that, do you know what? I, very similar. I don't think I had that many nerves that day. I remember meeting Matt Dammett, Matt Dammett on the way back down. He, and he was asking, maybe we'd had too many in the torch or something on the way before. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I thought 3-0. And you get a wonder strike, and then yeah, you know, it was just it was a wonderful day. And I guess the question I've got: Can you remember anything of the Halifax game at all? Do, do any do any of the guys? Yeah, I, was, I was really pissed off that I wasn't playing. <laughs> basically, I can so, imagine. So basically, we um, it was easy that week. To be honest, um, it was an easy week um, in preparation for the game. And for me, I want to win. So I wanted to go to Halifax and do the double. That's where I was at. And I trained properly all week. I was ready to go. And then obviously I got pulled the daily game and said, oh, look, we're going to give Sean a chance because he deserves a chance. And I get it. I get he deserves a chance, but I'm, I just want to win. So I wanted to go there and win. And I was really fucking pissed off after the game, to be honest, when we lost. Because I wanted to do the double. I, I, did, I did. But the reality was there was so much pressure on that game that anything else didn't matter. And, and I get that. I do get it. But... The chance to do a double didn't come around often, so I was a bit, yeah. A bit Sorry, Tom. Time, the, the final, we were very nervous. I remember getting on the coach for the final, and we were all really nervous. And the media guy did a video about our uh, season that season, uh, the goals, the celebrations, all the fun stuff. And that is what won us the final, I thought. Because we got on the coach, we put that on, and from that minute, the coach was silent. That went on. And then we're laughing and joking and buzzing on the bus with it. And then we got there and the nerves had just gone. And then after that, we were just on it and we, we just knew where we, where we were going to be. That, that, you know, that's really interesting. I didn't, that's, that's great to know. I mean, give that man a, give that man a penny. That's brilliant <laughs> stuff. Um, <laughs> a question is similar. Tom, did you want to ask anything else? Because the FA Trophy final is the thorn in your side because you didn't get to go to the um, playoff final. Um, what, yeah, I just what... wanted to say, uh, Josh, <laughs> that I am with you on the uh, FA Trophy final loss because, as Alex said, I didn't get to go to the playoff final. I lived abroad at the time. And uh, when it came about that we got to the trophy final, the flights were a lot cheaper because I was able to book it a lot further <laughs> in advance. I was like, well, we're guaranteed for that. I'll go for that one. Um and I just and really enjoyed the FA Trophy as a competition when we were down in non-league. And I, I really wanted to win a trophy. Like, getting promoted via the playoffs is great. But for me, it, it's not a trophy in the same way uh, as winning a, a, a league or a cup competition is. And so I, I was desperate to win it. And we'd had, we'd had quite a good record in it, in it yeah. under her. So I totally sympathise with you. So it's your fault then. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it helps, I mean, I've told this story far too many times, but I didn't have a ticket to the playoff final either when I was walking oh. down Wembley Way with my dad and he had his mate there. And he goes, oh, I goes, oh where's uh, where's Lisa? And he, oh, he's sitting next to us because he'd asked me to buy the tickets. And he said, oh, how many do you need? Two. Okay. So I assume he met me and him. And he goes, oh, no, he sat next to it. He sat next to us. How did you get that? Well, you got two tickets. Yeah, for me and you, not for a random oh, no. bloke <laughs> so I, I guess I, so i'm going they better sell tickets <laughs> so, <I was> the, <laughs> so i'm running around looking for wembley ticket office which is down in the deep uh trying yeah. to get i just have to sit randomly in the middle of the <laughs> very funny oh, no. anyway but it's, it's weird. i was dating my um now obviously missus and i've got kids at grimsby at the time that was the first game she came to the final. That's not a bad way to introduce you. you go, yeah, this is our yeah, home that's... place. Yeah, this is where we play. Yeah, I, don't I don't know if she's like a glory hunter or what. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm the only time words are about it. But yeah. she didn't talk to you for a week after Halifax. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't come to um, home to be fair. Maybe that's her fault as well. F Phil asked a question 
Uh, and uh, it's probably worth reminding this man is going to probably no, go nowhere near another football club. Did it annoy you having Fenty mooching about the dress, Braintree dressing room and Wembley pitch like he'd scored the winner himself? Uh, it does it does me, so you can be honest. <laughs> um, so, look, I know there's been a lot of, I don't know how to say it, um, animosity with John uh, regarding I hate him. Club. Yeah. So, John with me. Um, so, what you don't know is the year that we got promoted, I, I, had, I had a bad knee. So, um, and I couldn't train every day. And the, basically the club doctor was just like, yeah, you can't train anymore. You, you're going to be struggling. So John paid for me to go and see a specialist, get a knee up and get it all sorted. So, and, and what he did do in the summer when I had it done, he, he contacted me on a regular basis. So I was, and I made sure I was all right. So, you know, John's always been all right with me. Um, you know, I thank him for that because he got me through the season. So, but I also understand a lot of the history behind you guys and, and with John and stuff. So, you know, I can only go on my experience with, with John. So from, from that point of view, I, I, I can't say too many bad things about him. Um, we went to his house, we used to go to his house every start of every season. He'd throw a pie for all the team just to welcome him to the start of the season and stuff. But look, I know where he's at. I know he's tight. Because uh, there was times we, we'd want things done at the training ground and he'd be down there with his spade and shovel and do it himself rather than paying for anyone. To do it so i get where you're coming from and that sort of thing definitely <laughs> good stuff okay right and then lee so lee has asked a question that's coming and if anybody else wants to do it uh sorry if i miss this does josh want to manage town one day uh... um we'll see <laughs> we will see we'll, uh, we'll, i'll never say never that's for sure so we'll, we'll see how it goes obviously i'm not looking that far ahead um, obviously, I'm just starting out in my managerial career myself, so I've got aspirations. I mean, my aspiration is to get to the championship as a manager, minimum. So that's where I want to be, um, and that's what I'm working towards um, doing that. So, look, Grimsby is is a club that's always going to be in my heart. My kids are from here. My partner's from here. Um, the relationship I've got with the football club is amazing. The, the staff is here. I go in the club shop at times and speak to everyone. And obviously the things that I've done in my career here will just live with me forever. So um, the club's always going to be a part of me. So if it means I manage the club one day and I get that honour, then, then, then fantastic. But if I don't, it, for me, the memories are, are forever. Michael, I can't ask your um, top 11 because uh, we'd be here a while <laughs> naming your favourite town eleven. Um, so uh, James Howe asked, uh, "Grimsby are back in the league that you fought." So we've already talked about it. So how does it annoy you that they're back in this league so quickly after? The, yeah, the I, mean, I came to a lot of games last year, um, and yeah, I was I was angry to be honest because the the way it turned around so quickly. And the mismanagement of stuff at the start of last season, which is the reason why it ended up going the way it did, was disappointing for me. Because I think we just worked so hard to get there and get back up. And and to be honest, it was a poor league last year. And for us to go down last year in such a poor league, I was, yeah. Not... Were, you, were you surprised that a manager of sort of Ian Holloway's experience let, let's pre pre prepared a team in that way for that season? When I saw the signings, I was worried at the start of the season, if I'm going to be completely honest, because obviously we do our homework on players. And when 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 I saw a few of the signings, I was a bit... I mean, they took a few lads from, you know, Leeds below up mine, uh, which, you know, it's, it's League 2. It's, it's not the National League or, or our league. So I was slightly concerned. Um, but, you know, you look at him, he's charismatic. He spoke well. Um, he got everyone believing in the club. He got the fans together, which was great for a period. But... Obviously, I think not having a pre-season is just unbelievable. Uh, how that's happened, I don't know. Um, pre-season is the basis of your season. If you don't have a pre-season, you've not got a, a hope in hell of doing anything. And the fact that they didn't have a pre-season is beyond me. I've never heard anything like it. Play Cleethops? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Richard Young asked, uh, obviously with, with Giles Coke and, and Lenny coming here, was there any form of tension with you and, and Hurst over that? Or Yeah, I'd say yeah. so. I think I think when you've got something that someone else wants and you don't want to let it go, then obviously there's always going to be a bit of tension, to be honest. I think that's just human nature. Um, I didn't like the way 
things were portrayed in the press, if I'm going to be completely honest. I think better with a football rather than putting things out like that. But, you know, that's kind of, that's football, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it was. I was probably more disappointed with Lenny than I was anyone else, the way he went about it. Um, Giles' situation was different. Um, there was an issue. I mean, the, our, my football club has, has had issues, had, had admin issues that we've sorted and, and there was a big part to play in it. So, we, you know, we held our hands up and we held our hands up. Uh, with it and with the job situation, with his registration and stuff. I mean, he was at Grimsby for a pretty long time. So, uh, you know, us getting the blame for that was beyond me when he'd been in for two months or how long he'd been in. So no one checked his registration and we got the blame for it. So I felt that was a bit strange. But um, what I did do is I rang the club, I rang the FA, I rang the National League and I pushed it as much as I could to make sure that Giles could sign at Grimsby. And I did everything in my power to do that. And, you know, obviously for me to do that and then see that in the press was a bit disappointing. Lenny's wondering why he's been removed from that WhatsApp group. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so kick him, kick him. Um, uh, well, I guess he's, and now he's back facing you this season as well. Yeah, he's, do you he's play your game? Yeah, we've got York, so we've got Curzon Tuesday, Southport Saturday, and then we've got York next game. So I think it's his last game of the month, I think. Oh, wow, so, yeah. there you go. And that, 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 it's his last on loan, I think, if it's only yeah. for the month. Um, did you ever let Nathan Arnold cut your hair? Uh, what was your favourite chippy in town? Uh, and you seem to have a real affection with the town. What drives that? Because a lot of, I mean, maybe we just pick the ones that like us, but um, what? Is is there something different here? Is it because it's a cut off community, or and it's got no nothing else to to look to? I think. Well, my missus is from here, so I'm a, I'm a two kids from here, so that kind of helps. <laughs> so to be honest, but I tell you no, something: the, the the women of Grimsby do a hell of a lot of work for this. But if if it wasn't for Ben Davis's wife, he wouldn't be here. Exactly. <laughs> you're saying you've got no yeah. choice, Josh. That's what you're saying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, basically. If you wasn't here, I would not be here. <laughs> but um, no, um, obviously, when you when you do something that we did, you always have an affinity with a place that will never die. I think, and and the fans were great with me from day one. Even coming, knowing that I played for Lincoln, and then coming here, they um, were absolutely. You, you guys were absolutely fantastic with me, and and you just, I liked being at the football club for the pressure, if that makes sense. So, because I like the fan base, I like there was loads of fans, I like that there was a kind of expectation to, for us to go up and, and that kind of pressure. And I'd like to think I thrived into that. I played my best games when there were big crowds. So, I, I just loved being at the club, just everything about it. We had a great team spirit. And you'd go into town. The, the, the big thing for me is I've been at a lot of clubs and it's not often that you go into town and you see fans wearing the club shirt. And, you know, you walk around Grimsby and you see Grimsby hats, scarves, shirts everywhere and that's for me that's quite unique and, and you know i've traveled around quite a lot so for me just you could just you could just feel the passion for the football club and that was that's definitely something that's always stuck with me and, and why i've had such a kind of an affinity for the club and obviously the, the girls are decent and that's why i'm missing it <laughs> tom what's your question yeah um <laughs> excuse my ignorance josh where did you start your career so I started at West Brom, West Brom and Jalbion. And at what level were they playing at when you started? So we were Championship and Premier League. And um, then after that, then after that, my career went. <laughs> so do you think that um, since you started out, the the dynamic of the conference as a division has has changed um, immeasurably, or do you think it's pretty much the same as what it was when you started out? Well, I didn't know about the conference when I started out, I'm going to be completely honest. Um, if I'm going to be completely honest, it was a level that I never thought I'd want to be at um, or, or play at. And, and that's, as an aspiring young lad, you want to play in the Premier League. So you're not yeah. looking at the National League and that stuff. But what I would say is when I dropped in the National League to what it is now, it's got a lot more professional. There's a lot more football played. It pees me off when you see FA Cup games and you hear commentators saying, oh, they'll blow up because they're part-time players. Well, with all due respect, most teams in the National League now, well, especially in the Premier, are full-time. So um, I think the professionalism's got a lot better. Um, the standard of coaching's got better. I think the players have got better. But along with that, the money's obviously increased exponentially. And if you look at 
some of the big clubs like the, the Chesterfields, the Stockports, they're paying a lot more money than most of the football league clubs, which is yeah. why you find a better calibre of player at this level. Um, but what I would say is the National League as a brand needs to be better because it's got a, it's got a commodity. It's got should have a brand that you know as far reaching, and, and I think it needs to be better. Um, with that side of things, the sponsorship, the commercial side of things, I, I do think it needs to be improved. Because if you look at the Football League and, and the Premier League, the, the the commercial revenue they bring in from being organised and getting the right sponsorship in is, is, is massive. And I think the, the National League needs to get on their page a little bit. Do you think, do you not think, so on that note, do you not think that is where the lower leagues have missed out with the, the European Super League? So if like the top, say six or seven clubs, whatever it was, had gone off and formed their own Super League. That would have left 14 clubs in the Premier League, which for the English Premier League audience wouldn't have been, in my opinion, sufficient to sustain a division. So at that point, in my opinion, the the power actually is with the Football League and non-league to say, OK, you're now without a division, you can come back into our league, but we're going to reset the, the rules and make it more homogenous and we're going to return the League Cup to being, say, finish on the night extra time and penalties, not going straight to penalties because, let's face it, from a fan's point of view, that is complete and utter shite. And not having replays in the FA Cup... Um, or not having replays like early on in the FA Cup. I, I can't remember how they do it now, but basically the new format of the FA Cup is a bit rubbish as well from a fan's perspective. Yeah. Do you not think that was a great opportunity for the whole of English football to say, no, we're, we're bigger than six clubs rather than the sort of... From my point of view, it was a kind of like sort of fake, oh, no, we really like football from like Chelsea fans, Tottenham fans, because yeah. really they just want to maintain the status quo. Yeah, but again, if you look at money, um, those six clubs bring in the money for the, for football in England. And if you lose that, there will be a trickle-down effect. And yes, they don't. They should probably give more um, money down the pyramid. But I think if you lose that revenue, you're losing a massive audience, aren't you? And that, I think, would have a trickle-down effect with the finances of the championship and the football league. So I just don't think the Premier League will let that happen anyway because of the money they make. But I just, I don't think it would have been good for football personally. Um, I think that it needs to be regulated more. I think the finances need to be regulated better because if you look at, you know, there was a period obviously last year um, when we had, when we had the grant situation um, and we needed whatever money. I mean, we got like 20, we got, we didn't get anything basically. And if you look at the Premier League, you know, one club could have given a million to the our level and it would have sorted our level out for the whole season. So when the disparity in money is like that, there needs to be... And look, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm a Liverpool fan and, you know, the managers are excellent there and they've got a great team, the commercial side level and they, they bring all this money in. I'm not saying, well, because you're bringing that in, we've got to have it all. But I just think, like, this is what I'm speaking about the Premier League. If the, the, the league is more nationalised, as in the, we've got more control of it, the money will flow down better and it will flow down all through the pyramid. So then we'll have two teams going up for my level with the playoffs. There are three, three teams from the National League. Because if you look at if you look at the National League right now, there's probably five teams in that National League that if they went in League Two would make League Two better. And there's probably five teams in League Two right now that are just hanging above the red line every season and just hanging in there. So you take them out and all of a sudden League Two is excellent. The National League, there's probably three or four teams at our level that would go in the National League and make the National League a lot better. And then you have a, a group there. So that needs to change. That structure needs to change. There needs to be more teams going up and down. And I think that will make it more competitive. But those six teams breaking away from English football, I think would be disastrous financially for everybody else. I really do. Hmm. Mike, were you, Mike, what were you going to ask? Um, I... Yes. So yeah. James James Howes was asking... Um, so what what have been your big influences uh, on your management career? Um, he's read that you're big on science. He's sort of wondering where that's come from. Um, and tying in with that, Matt Elon would like to know who have you sort of lent on the most as you started off in your management career? So um, 
I would say, so Sean Sean Driscoll, um, when I was at Bournemouth, was probably the biggest influence in my career. He was was meticulous with all his details. Uh, We did analysis. We brought in a psychologist. um, If lads had any issues, he was well above his time. And then there was uh, Richard O'Kelly, who was just the the absolute most positive man. Um, Then there was uh, Big Knot (laughs) in a different way. Um, with things, um, so I've, I've took bits from a lot of managers to kind of mould and shape the way I want to be, at, you know, as a, as a manager for sure. I mean, what did you learn from Big Knot? Well, when I when I was with Sean, um, we used to do analysis, and I was very. I, I thought when I was going to be a manager, I was going to be right. We're going to do our analysis sessions every week. We're going to do this, this, and this. And then when Marcus come in, we do three hour analysis sessions. And I just see the effect that had on the mentality of the squad. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to do that. And, and I think you, you just need um, a good balance. Um, I know he, some of the, some of the things he did were excellent and I'm not going to speak too highly of him because yeah, but um, some of the things he did were good, but then just, you just take things from people and, and you just sit back as, as, as I was a, you know, at that period, um, looking at the next phase of my career and, and you look at the good and the bad things and, and you pick bits out. And for me, it was just a bit too long. And and really, footballers have got a tension span of about 20 minutes. So, you know, if you're in a room for three hours, you, you're probably going to, the lads are going to take on 10, 15 minutes of it. And then the rest of it is immaterial, it's irrelevant. So, yeah, I, I took a lot from that. Um, but Sean was a real big influence on me, real big. And and same with uh, Hursty, just his competitive training. So uh, training was always competitive, it was competitive. So, you know, just getting that balance uh, was important for me um, going into managing. And I think it's a good thing that I've gone in now because I'm, I've am i obviously, I've been in a while now, but not long finished training. So you kind of, you know what you want to feel in a training session and how, you, how it flows and, I'm not too detached from playing that I understand, you know, the tempo and all that stuff of, of a training session. So that was big for me. But the science side of things, um, I have obviously did a psychology degree. Um, I looked at football and when I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s, I started looking at football and having a look at the way it was going. And I just felt that the mental health side of things was vital moving forward and, and you know, player development and the way the tonality of players was important. So I wanted to learn that and I wanted to learn, you know, how to get the best habits out of players and how to speak to them and what drives them and what motivates them. So that's that that drive was was what that came from really and just doing loads of reading and research on things. So yeah, that more than anything. I've just had that real like, realization I'm not at work tomorrow. Sorry. I've just <laughs> looked in look in my schedule, see what's going on. Um the, one of the questions that we get asked by every player uh, for every player is who was the best player you ever played with? Let's go with town and then overall, because I imagine that both Bournemouth and uh, one thing we haven't touched on is, is sort of your time in the Danish Super League as well at the beginning of your career. Who yeah. were the best players that you played with that sort of stick out of your mind, both at town and elsewhere? I mean, away from here, there was a lad called Stephen Cook. Um, he was Villa. He made his debut when he was 17 against Man U. He was unbelievable. But he just had injury after injury, and he, he just didn't um, didn't materialise. But the one name that really sticks out was probably Darren Anderton. I just think. I mean, that's the... cheating. Well, <laughs> I remember we played a game. I remember playing a game at home, and I passed him a ball, and he's got his back to play, and he's picked up the ball, turned, and just hit a diag about fifty yards. And I looked at him, and I thought, oh, I didn't see that pass, and I was looking at the whole pitch. I was just like, wow, like some of the things he could do with the ball were just unbelievable. And you could just, you know why he's playing, you knew why he played at that level. Just his, his game IQ was just ridiculous. It was just, honestly, it was just on another level. Was he from Bournemouth originally? Was that why he, he went there? Yeah, he was down that way. He had a house and everything down there. So, um, yeah. He he's got to live on sandbanks, hasn't he? So, there's another place called Wrexham, which is as rich, pretty much. Okay. Know, a big house. And his house, I think Harry Redknapp had a house there as well next door to him. So you sort of like house parties there and you go around there and you're like, yeah, this guy's living the life. A big pool and everything. And just like, Josh is with there with his business card. <laughs> yeah. Help <laughs> me about that, please. <laughs> and, and what about at town? Who was sort of the, the, the most gifted at Cheapside? Um, We've got to change the name of our training ground. 
Um, it's a difficult one, really. I think Nave was Nave could change a game. Uh, I think Marshy was the most skillful, um, definitely the most skillful. Uh, but I think I thought Nave could just change a game. He could just, he could just, he was big, strong, quick. He just, he could just change a game. And then Podge was probably the best finisher. He would do nothing in a game when he used to get asked to, he used to. Sometimes with Pod, right, we'd be like 80 <laughs> minutes in a game. I'm like, you're getting it in the changing room after the game. And then the 89th minute, it would go and score. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> 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 but he just, he just, he just scored goals. I mean, the year we went up, he was unreal, wasn't he? Everything. Oh, we've lost Grim's beat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was, that's unfortunate. Who changed my thing to Hurston? I did it. <laughs> I'll see if um, I'll, I'll take Josh when he starts moving again because it's a rather unflattering image of the poor guy. Uh, <laughs> see if that fixes it. I mean, I I, I want to ask Josh as well. I want to know if they're still in a WhatsApp group together. I want to know if um, what that WhatsApp group looked out. Like. You know that day that um, Macca stood in uh, Podge stood in front of Macca against Newport. <laughs> For that free kick. Yeah. I'd have loved to have seen the WhatsApp group that day. <laughs> I hope we haven't lost Grimsby. Have we lost any viewers? Yeah, maybe it's Grimsby. We're all right down here, aren't we? It's finally Storm Eustace has got up there and taken revenge. Apparently Leeds is 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 mullered today. Uh apparently there's a barge stuck underneath the why did I do that? It's stuck under um stuck under the Leeds train station. And it can't, no trains can get in and out. Uh, so that must be fun for Yorkshire Police, who had 900 officers on duty for their game with Manchester United today. <laughs> oh, slightly less for when we go go to Nottingham, then. Oh, yes, yeah, slightly less, yeah. But we have we we obviously have Times journalists as well to help out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. One thing Bye. I was going to ask. Well, one thing I was going to ask you, Josh, is if you guys have still got a, a um, WhatsApp group. Speaking of Podge. I'd have loved to have known what the reaction was like. There was a day um, when uh, when we played Newport and Podge was there. He went and stood in front of Macca for a free kick. Were you? Yeah. I would love to have known what the reaction was in that group that day. <laughs> there must have been some effing and jeffing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually keep in contact with Podge. I spoke to him not long ago, actually, because he's that extra, isn't he? So, he um, is. yeah, and he's, he's looking at transitioning his next phase of his career as well, so... He's going to go down the coaching and managing route as well. Are you, are you, are you uh, trying to get a, an option for a player sort of coach role for him at Hereford? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> wondering, wondering why Hereford have scored 95 goals last year, next season. <laughs> <laughs> All from a grand total of 35 yards. <laughs> um, what were your... Are there any other stories that... Are there any stories that you can tell about your time at town to wrap it up uh, that we might not have necessarily asked? Are there any abiding memories that you do have? I'm just just a Moro being everywhere in his shorts and t-shirt, no matter what the weather. <laughs> I'm really in it, more. The strongest think was... man. Walking around the training ground with his dog. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's everywhere watching me. Yeah, he'd have his dog, and he'd just be walking around the training ground with his dog. And he'd be like, Moro, someone's injured. He'd be like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. And he shorts a T-shirt in the middle of winter when it's snowing. <laughs> I, I, think I, was, I, I think I saw Dave Moore with his, sh- with his trousers on once, and that was a day that I was very worried of what was going on. <laughs> oh, wow. I've still yet to see it. Never seen it. I'd, I'd love it. I mean, we've got to get to a point where um, he's got to be invited to a wedding or an event of yeah. some sort where formal wear, and he'll just be in shorts. I'm gonna invite. I'm gonna make up an event and invite him. So there's no one there, and he's just gonna come on his own and just just so I can see him in bombs. Have, have you him. had Have you had Christians yet or anything? No, not yet. No. I'm gonna go. get him one day. Because even when I see him, I've seen him pass him a few times. We've been in a car, so you can't see his legs. So you're not sure if he's got trousers on or not. So I know this is a bit weird, but yeah. <laughs> I do like that idea. I'd love him to win like some sort of PFA award for like recognition. And he's up there with, I don't know, Gary Lineker. In, <laughs> and he's just That's in short. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's basically made for every Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant. Have you guys got anything else to ask before we let Josh get on his way? Because I assume he's got some planning to do this week. 
Yeah, so some of us have got work as well, mate, not you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it was quite nice. It's like that thing of waking up and realising it's not Monday. Uh, but I'm sure I've got other things to do. It's half term. Um, Josh, it's an absolute pleasure, man. And we welcome you back any time because it's, it's so good to hear happen. about it. It's good to speak to you guys anyway because it's been... Um... I'm obviously, there was that game, what was the last game? Was that? was that Halifax game was the last game I came to. So it's just nice to obviously still speak to everyone and obviously relive good memories. It's always good. There was a fair few Mariners at that former Mariners. Uh, Robbie Stockdale was there. Yeah. Um, and congratulations to him on beating Scunny at the weekend. Love um, it. <laughs> yeah, I think they might be going down. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're not coming back for a while, unfortunately. I mean, it's good for the region, I guess. Sound um, breaking it. Yeah, are you as a former Lincoln player? Are you are you are you surprised Lincoln is starting to to slow, or are they just having a fallow year? Yeah, it's a difficult one because I think they hit some real good momentum, didn't they, with the Cowley brothers? And Appleton's a really good coach as well. He is, to be fair. And I know him when I was at West Brom, he was playing in the first team, so he's you know meticulous with details and he's a really good coach. So yeah, they had I a think, lot of loan signings in the last year. Yeah, I think it's and it. I mean, you get some really good lads in from loan, but are they yours? No, they're not. And I think they're coming in for a reason, aren't they? They get back in their first team or get moved somewhere else. So and I think when they go back, then you're kind of left with players that I think sometimes that are, when well, you brought loans in for a reason, haven't you? So, um, but no, I, yeah, I think they have slowed. I think they'll pick back up. I think they're in, in, a good, in a good play. The moves training ground, they've got a really good training ground now. They've got good facilities. I think they've invested in the club wisely, I think. So I think they're steady. I, I think they'll always be steady in that league. Now, I mean, they started really well, didn't they, the start of the season? And you're thinking, oh, they're going to go again here. And then they've just, they've, they've, they've just fallen off. I don't know what money they're investing in the squad. So I, I don't know why they've dropped off. or Because, I mean, I know a lot of clubs, the you know, National League and the leagues above, are spending a lot of money. So whether or not that money's just dried up now, I don't, I don't know. But, yeah, I mean, they're just, they've established themselves as a football league club again, haven't they? And I think that was probably, if, you, if you'd asked them to do that five years ago, six years ago, whenever it was, they probably would have said no chance. So I think they're in a really good place. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's all right. <laughs> it, all I can say is it's good for the region, I guess. If it's a strong region, it's a strong, strong opportunity. It's, it's when we start taking players on loan, it'll hurt. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's been a pleasure. And thank you so much. And thank you to everyone to listening. Mikey, thank yeah. you for joining us. So glad you survived Hurricane, whatever it's called. Same with you, Tom. You are coming soon, isn't it? Oh, brilliant! I've oh, only yeah. just taken. I had, I was out there with a Dreville taking down a metal gazebo yesterday. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing worse than being in the south when there's cold, bad weather. We need a coat. Know. They're not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh well. Uh, well, speaking of down south, we'll see you around here sometime soon, Josh. But um, speak you see, yeah. see everybody. I'm gonna. I'm not even gonna do the the code.